<laughs> All right. So I'm just going to tell you a short little story about setting up a makerspace, hackerspace in India, and at the same time, what's going on, and what are the kind of things that are happening over there. All right. So a little back history about who I am. I used to work at this company called Inetra. It was this crazy bunch of guys that we were working at MIT Media Labs in Boston, making eye diagnostic devices. The small handheld device worked with a smartphone, and uh, with a couple clicks of a button, it would give you your prescription. So you can go and get your eyeglasses. So uh, worked with a simple smartphone. Uh, over there, there was this place called Artisan's Asylum, which is one of the biggest um, hacker maker spaces in the United States. It's about the size of two football fields. It's huge. And uh, there are all sorts of artists, engineers, uh, people from all backgrounds working in one place, making some very interesting things. Anything from jewelry, to welding, to tables and chairs, to uh, healthcare diagnostic devices. But the most important part about this space was the kind of people that were there, the culture and the community. Uh, this was the first time for somebody like me to get an experience like that, and that's where I was building that device for Rainetra, the hardware part of it. Uh, eventually, Ainetra asked me to go back to India because obviously the device had more impact in India than it did in Boston. So I took the next flight, landed up in Mumbai, started traveling to small little villages, taking eye tests, and uh, coming up with hardware improvements to the device. And uh, the, this was one of the shops that I was making the device in. It was a tiny little chawl, and we were using all the uh, mainly like lathe machines and milling machines to make the device whereas the device in Boston was 3D printed and everything. So we had a slow process of doing it, but we were coming up with improvements. Eventually, one fine day, the ceiling of our office fell down and it broke everything. It broke our table, it broke our furniture, it broke pretty much everything that we owned. Uh, that's when, instead of buying new furniture, we uh, created a small meetup. Oh, I don't have a photo there graph of that. Any which ways, we created a little meetup, like a get together, an event just like this, to build some tables. And that got like some interesting people together in Mumbai, and we started building together. And every meeting, uh, weekend after that, we would get together and make something all together, just like a small hacker space. And we would hack something like LED cubes or water bottle bazookas, all sorts of fun things. Eventually, uh, we moved out of there and we found a little garage in Bandra where afterwards, in a couple of months, it started looking like this, which, and it was quite happening, all sorts of people coming from different parts of Mumbai, getting together, and that's where I met Swa. Swa is a part of CCC, and she came down to Mumbai, and she was starting Hill Hacks in Dharamshala. And uh, that's where I found out about the bigger maker culture and the hackerspace community around the world, and we started doing more about this. And then I eventually got serious, I quit my beautiful, uh, American salary paying job and started working on creating this hackerspace uh, or makerspace in Mumbai. Eventually we moved inside a bigger space which was a part of a design school. They had given us some space for a little bit of time and that's how the space eventually started looking. And we kept all the equipment in there like 3D printers, laser cutters, we started getting, we started doing workshops and trainings to get uh, funding and uh, at the same time, uh, started building the space using that. In India, on the other hand, we don't, uh, we don't get government funding for all these things. So we have to figure out sustainable models. And so we were doing a lot of these trainings, which were getting sort of interesting. Uh, but one exciting thing about the trainings was that because we were doing it inside a design school, so we had a lot of artists coming in, and then we had a lot of engineers from outside coming in to learn 3D printing. And one thing that happened over over that time was that the engineers would just understand everything about how the equipment worked. And they would just pay attention to the part of how it works and how they can make it better, everything. But the artists paid no attention to that. They just paid attention to the beautiful things that they can make out of the 3D printer. And that led to some very interesting collaborations, like this robot. So on the outside, it's origami. It's all paper folding. And But on the inside, it was all robotics and electronics that made it walk and move. So uh, it, the entire inside of it was all 3D printed, which is pretty exciting. 
Eventually, we set up a small uh, hackerspace, makerspace in Delhi as well. And this is how it looks outside. And what it says is half in Hindi and half in English, pass it on, which is our Wi-Fi password. <laughs> and at the same time, more of which became our philosophy of passing on the knowledge and everything. Uh, and that started a beautiful community in Delhi as well, created a common ground for people to get together and try out new things. Eventually, I went back to Mumbai and I saw this. The space in Mumbai was packed and there were artists doing all sorts of things like dyeing clothes. At the same time, engineers were trying to find a place to work and nothing was getting done. More than that, we had also started using the place in the design school that wasn't given to us. So that started creating some issues with the design school. <laughs> Eventually, we uh, went out to look for another place because we were, it was time to move on. And we raised a crowdfunding campaign, raised a little bit of money, and used that to set up a new space. The interesting thing about this was, again, the entire community got together to build the space. So this time, about 100 people showed up over a span of two months. And we did everything from like doing up the walls to refurbishing all the chairs and everything. And now the space looks something like this. Uh, it's about 13,000 square feet. And within, uh, there's one entire floor, which is just the lab. And it has everything from laser cutting, 3D printing, screen printing, uh, electronics lab and everything. So it's beautiful to see how the community got together to make this. Um, but what we'd done was that we created a beautiful cult of unlike-minded people because that's where the good ideas started coming out from, because everyone was outside of their comfort zone with people from all sorts of backgrounds, which sort of made it very exciting. And then while we were building our little makerspace, there were over 25 different makerspaces that started coming across India, including Dharamshala, where Swa set up a makerspace or hackerspace, and uh, a lot of others in various parts of India. And this sort of became like an entire Indian movement and now there are about 25 of them, if I'm not mistaken. And all of them are sort of finding their own ways of becoming self-sustaining, which is exciting. To give you an example of the kind of projects that are going out at these places, especially at the asylum, there is a girl who does a lot of uh, leather work. She makes leather bags. So she uh, etches them using the laser cutter, customizes them, and then sells them out. There is a doctor who's building uh, a retinal imaging device so that he can start recording uh, images of the patient's retinas and then do further analysis on them. And what's again exciting is the doctor himself is making it. And when you think of the Indian subcontext, because there are so many problems out there compared to the first world. So every problem that you look at needs, a, whenever somebody tries to solve a problem, it's always about solving a bigger problem. And something like this is what was exciting. And then there were more interesting things like Claire was working on prosthetic limbs uh, and she started collaborating with my human kit in France and started making more advanced versions of prosthetics. There is uh, Krishna who's making an air diagnostic device. So it pretty much uh, takes images of your eardrum uh, and sends it to the doctor for telemedicine. But what's exciting about it is that he hacked a headphone to make it. And uh, if you think about it, for little kids who move a lot, it's amazing because even if they move, the camera is moving relative to their head and hence you still get a decent image. So which was exciting. Uh, there is another guy who is working on a Domato device. It attaches to your phone and takes images of your skin for skin diagnosis. What's again exciting is that this device usually costs about a thousand euros in the market. But when you make a clip on for your phone, it costs like less than a single euro. And what he did is that it's all a 3D printed device, but he put a lens inside it from an old CD-ROM drive to magnify the camera. It's very simple. So pretty much nothing, just about hacking it out and eventually creating something exciting. There are these guys. Uh, have you heard of the Satnogs project? Okay, it was a project that was started in Greece and they're building a bunch of these satellite ground stations around the world so that you have open source data being collected and at the same time being broadcasted further so that 
people can have that data. Uh, it was a project that won the Hackaday Prize two years back, and uh, they're building one over there as well, which is going to be technically the first one in Asia. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Uh, there is a guy making music out of hydraulics and woodwork. There is a guy who's making an auto rickshaw with gullwing doors. <laughs> so there's so many exciting different, different kinds of projects that are going on. It's amazing. So that's all I really wanted to share. <laughs> and uh, it's been an exciting time to set up um, and see the maker movement grow in India. And uh, I think it's a beautiful place. So I think you guys should definitely come. <laughs> If you have any questions, I'm all yours. Thank you. Hey. So how long did the entire process from when you first started in Mumbai uh, take till now? Uh, two years now. Two years? Yes. Three, four spaces, right? Four spaces. Wow. Every eight, seven to eight months, we moved to a new space. <laughs> <laughs> So we never really had a stable space. Uh, the first one was inside Anatra's office, which lasted about five months. And then we got the garage, which lasted about eight months. Then we moved to the design school, which was about another eight months. And now we moved to our final space, where we've actually been settled. To Delhi and the new space, they're both kind of more of a base for us now. <laughs> Can you repeat the questions, please? Can I repeat? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> So the question for this one was, how how long has it been since we started? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so there are a couple of people. Uh, so the question was, how many people are usually active at the makerspace or the hackerspace? <clears throat> because it's really huge. Uh, so there is a part of the space which is co-working. So there are startups sort of working over there in the new space. So we wanted them to be a part of the space. So that uh, including them, you would see about 40 people on a daily average. But there are over 200 members right now in the space in Mumbai. And then the space in Delhi has about 25. But more often than not, we do a lot of events. Um, and for these events and workshops, um, we see a lot of people coming in. And the events is something what is one of the reasons why I'm actually here. So I was actually traveling around France because the French embassy asked me to travel around France and check out what's happening there and uh, try and get some collaborations in India. So I'm, I was about there for about three weeks and <clears throat> traveling to various spots, researching on one thing, which was education. <clears throat> to see where, <clears throat> how these hackerspaces and makerspaces can create a new form of education. So if you think about it, what's happening in all these makerspaces, hackerspaces is that they're doing all sorts of workshops. People are coming and doing all sorts of projects. They're open source projects most of the times. And they're documenting these projects. That project, plus all the knowledge that they've learned, plus some people, usually a lot of the people also do online courses. If you mix all of them, it's pretty much creating everything that a college gives you. So. So what we said is that, how about if you think about it this way, that uh, instead of asking people to study to become an architect or study to become a doctor, let them explore. Let them be at a space like a hackerspace, makerspace, anywhere in the world. Go and do the courses they want to, to be able to create that project that they're interested in. And based on the documentation of the project and the courses that they've got done, we'll give them a degree. So the reverse way. And so that's something that I was, <clears throat> we've been sort of researching on. And uh, it's uh, got some exciting eyes. So just traveling around to see what's possible. <clears throat> uh, what's the demographic like at this place? Um, maybe students or um, pupils or pupils other groups? So the question was, what are the dem uh, demographics like at this space? <clears throat> so interestingly, there are about 40% girls at the space, which is very interesting for a place like India. Uh, and apart from that, 
the average age would be around, the last we checked, around 25, 26. So there are a lot of people who are coming to the space who have recently retired, which is interesting. And they're coming to the space to explore and do exciting things and pass on their knowledge. But then you also have a lot of students who are coming in. So, and uh, then you also have the guys who are doing s smaller companies and startups. So it's actually quite varied. You see, on a regular day, you would see people who are slightly older and at the same time, very young. Any other questions? I'll repeat your question. So the question was, uh, the degree path that I was talking about of hackerspaces and based on workshops and project-based learning, is that something that's already been done or is it something that can will be done now and in the future? So it is for the future. And uh, so personally, I, don't, I haven't been a big fan of degrees. I left my degree when I got it. But at the same time, uh, if you look at it from a bigger subcontext of India and other places, uh, the family usually wants them to go into that specific path. And at the same time, if you're looking for eventually want to go into a job or a, the industry, they want that uh, degree or something that accumulates your knowledge and says you are a X. So it makes it easy for further uh, studies or further work. And that's one of the reasons why we were doing that so that it becomes sort of at the same time for hackerspaces and makerspaces to, uh, uh, especially in places like India, to become more sustainable because now families have a reason to have their kids over there and it's easier for them to explain that they can go down an alternative education route compared to a direct, always college route. And at the same time, so it's, it's an experiment, to be honest. Right now, it's going to start with a basic certification that we're going to try to do now. Uh, so think of it like this, that uh, you walk into a hackerspace or a makerspace and you stay there for six months because otherwise people go in and out too much. So you ask them to stay for six months and in the six months, they can do whatever they want. And at the end of the six months, based on their projects, you get a small, maybe letter, or a certificate that says that you've done these, these, these things. So this would give more of a reason for people to continue being there for longer, maybe, uh, especially in a place like India where uh, you want to focus on education at an early age. So the question was, do we have any support from the government or any corporate, uh, or is it just uh, Kickstarter or crowdfunding money? Uh, so in India, we don't get, uh, we haven't been getting support by the government yet. Um, so what we're trying to do is create a self-sustainable model so that the money comes in and goes and runs the space. Uh, that does mean that we don't have any funding from corporates, but uh, we do do some corporate events at the space once in a month. So something like a hackathon or something which is sponsored by the corporate then. So it is for people, but then we try and get a corporate sponsor so that we can uh, even out the costs of running the space for at least about a month or a couple of weeks. And that way we can renew it. Our overheads are pretty low. If you think about it, apart from the rent that we pay, which is the most, the biggest thing, uh, the rest of the things at the space are usually taken care of. So we don't have to worry about too much. And SWA is actually doing something very exciting in Dharamshala as well. So over there, it's a more a give what you want kind of a model. So if you want to pay, you pay. You don't want to pay, you don't want to pay. That kind of a model. It's the same at 
Mumbai uh, in a way that if you can't pay, you just tell us why. Otherwise, you walk in. That's the way usually I think most places work. Uh, and her Hilax model is also very similar where they're getting together and doing a lot of very exciting things when people from all over the world are traveling there and teaching uh, little kids and students in the village in the small towns on how to maybe solder or learn about electronics, exposing them to new exciting things. Any other questions? Time for beer? All right. <laughs> Thank you.